We wanna welcome everybody tonight. This is going to be a wonderful night with Dr. Phyllis Sagano. She's one of my personal sheroes in the Catholic Church. Um, and she's going to talk to us about, uh, you know, as part of our Women in Race series, we've had quite a number of these and we can plan on continuing them to talk about how women have been erased from the scriptures, from our history. And so tonight she's gonna to talk about how women are icons of Christ, which is uh, extremely important. So um, before we, I introduce her, we're gonna start with a prayer and Russ is going to lead that prayer tonight. Great, thanks Deb. Um, so I thought instead of uh, a, a said prayer or recited prayer, we'd begin with a song it's called Women of the Church uh, by Carrie Landry, and I'll share the uh, lyrics with you. And um, since you're all muted, I do invite you to uh, sing along at home. So I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Zagano tonight and to give you, uh, I think she needs no introduction in many ways for most of us, but uh, her list of accomplishments is so incredible that um, it would be sad to uh, not <laughs> at least list some of those tonight. Dr. Zagano is Senior Research Associate in Residence and Adjunct Professor of religion at Hofstra University. She is the author or editor of 23 books, including Holy Saturday, An Argument for the Restoration of the Female Diaconate in the Catholic Church, which won awards from the Catholic Press Association and College Theology Society Annual Book Awards, and Women in Catholicism, Gender, Communion, and Authority, which also won the Catholic Press Association Book Award. 
Dr. Zagano's recent books include Women Deacons, Past, Present, Future with Gary Macy and William Deitwig, Women in Ministry, Emerging Questions on the Diaconate, Mysticism and the Spiritual Quest, Ordination of Women to the Diaconate in Eastern Churches, and Women Deacons, Essays with Answers. And finally, the book that she'll talk a little bit about tonight, Women, Icons of Christ from Paulus Press, just, just published. Her works have been translated into many languages. Dr. Zagano is the founding co-chair of the Roman Catholic Studies Group of the American Academy of Religion. She has a whole other lot of accomplishments. Her award-winning column was nationally syndicated by Religious News Service until 2010 and now runs in the National Catholic Reporter, which I'm sure you all read, and in other journals around the world. She has published hundreds of articles and reviews in popular and refereed uh, journals. And for five years, I didn't know this, hosted a monthly talk show on National Public Radio affiliate WBUR-FM. Her papers are collected at the Gannon Women and Leadership Archives at Loyola University in Chicago. And on August 2nd, 2016, Pope Francis appointed her to the Papal Commission for the Study of Women in the Diaconate, which convened in Rome in November 2016. For all of her intense and important work on that commission, we are profoundly grateful. So dear friends, I give you Dr. Phyllis Sagano. Hi. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Um, <clears throat> it's great to be here with you all. And, and I'm so grateful for Future Church for its steadfast support. You know, um, I have to tell you, it was about, it, it had to be almost 20 years ago, I appeared at a Future Church event in, I don't know where, Ohio. It was in a parish and <clears throat> there were people picketing the parish. And I went outside to find out what was going on. <clears throat> and, and there were lovely ladies with chapel veils and rosary beads around their necks and they had signs. And I said, what's going on? And they said, Phyllis Sagano is gonna speak here. I said, you're kidding. And uh, uh, I went inside. And, and that's the reason I don't have my picture on, on books. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's funny that people get an idea of who you are uh, without, uh, without meeting you. I don't remember much about that conversation. I know Chris Schenk, I remember Chris driving me to the airport. I stayed at the Sisters of St. Joseph Mother House there in Cleveland. Um, <clears throat> so I'm happy to be back with Future Church, which does, does work beyond what I do. And, uh, I stay in my lane and my lane is women deacons. And, and as Deb said, for that reason, the Holy Father appointed me uh, on August 2nd, 2016 to be part of the, and I'll correct you for a minute, the Papal Committee for the Study of the Diaconate of Women um, was the, the Italian title. And uh, we met four times uh, in Rome until June of 2018 and prepared a document uh, for the Holy Father's eyes only uh, I was um, uh, sort of elected the, the, uh, the expert on the commission. There were 12 of us, um, six men, six women, and uh, the men were all uh, priests. And uh, of the women, uh, three of us were nominated by the International Union of Superiors General, myself and two women religious. Uh, most of the commissioners lived in, in Rome, uh, but because I had foundation funding, I was able to live in Rome uh, for about five months out of those two years, back and forth a couple of times. Um, and I lived in the Casa Santa Marta in, in the residence of the Holy Father. So I did have the opportunity to address my issue and my, my interest uh, with cardinals and bishops who passed through. Uh, and uh, uh, they had a chance to get me, get a look at me up close and I had a chance to look at them up close. Well, <clears throat> the commission met and uh, I'll tell you the end of the story. We prepared a document for the Holy Father, which a year later in May of 2019, uh, he gave a portion of it to the uh, 
assembled sisters, actually to the president at the time, Carmen Samut of the International uh, Union of Superiors General, UISG, gave that document to them uh, in May of 2019. I was in the hall and uh, he said, here's the little they agreed on. And uh, uh, to this day, I don't know what he's talking about. So uh, I've seen what they got and I know what we gave him. Um, we have never had what we gave him uh, share. Uh, we have we have never had shared with us the transmittal letter, letter of Cardinal Ladaria, uh, nor the actual documents that went to him. Be that as it may, uh, fast forward to um, April eighth, twenty twenty, and the Holy Father, uh, responding actually to the request of the Amazon Synod, actually named a whole new commission with ten people, five men, five five women a new chairman, Cardinal Petrocchi of Aquila in Italy, and a new secretary, Denis de Pontfortville, who's a French priest and a staff member of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Uh, Dupont, I have met de Pontfortville, I actually met him when he was uh, interviewing uh, for the job. And he's an interesting pick because for five years, he was the uh, point man for training deacons in the Archdiocese of Paris. And uh, uh, they have not met yet. Uh, even by Zoom, <clears throat> they expect to meet in the fall in person. So we'll see how COVID and the Vatican, uh, if they get to get to agree on uh, on an in person meeting, and uh, and we'll see where it goes. Uh, I have no more real inside information about about any of that, but I can I'm sure with you I was was happy to see that on the uh, feast of the baptism of the Lord, uh, the Holy Father uh, released a motu proprio, an apostolic letter motu proprio, which means on his own accord. Nobody asked him to do it, he just did it. And uh, it's uh, called Spiritus Domini. And what it says, it uh, revises Canon 230 paragraph one to say that any lay person can be formally installed to the um, ministry, the installed lay ministry of Lecter and Acolyte. And it doesn't sound like much, um, but down in the, uh, in the apostolic letter, there's a little sentence that says, and any place else uh, that lay people are restricted to be male males, um, we'll get rid of that too in canon law. So that's an interesting, interesting move. Uh, it was requested by the Amazon Synod in 2019. It was also requested by a Synod of Bishops in 2008. So you can see how fast they move. Anyway, um, why is it important? It's important because uh, in order to be ordained a deacon, you have to first be have the uh, have the ministry be installed in the ministry of lector and then installed in the ministry of acolyte, and you actually have to uh, uh, take part in, in in those ministries. You have to do those ministries. So, uh, I'm writing a longer piece right now for the pastoral uh, review in in London, but I have a short piece that moved yesterday on uh, the Sapientia blog of uh, Fordham University. It really talks about the, the import of this, uh, this change. But we'll get back to the book because that's what, what uh, uh, Deb asked me to talk about. This is the book, uh, Women Icons of Christ. I hate to sound like a commercial, but, but this is a really beautiful photograph um, of uh, the Annunciation. It's by uh, Antonella de Messina. And it, it, it is uh, in, the, um, in the museum in Palermo. Uh, I, have, I, have, I should have put it up for you. There's a great picture of me standing next to actually the, 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 real, the real picture. But this is the Annunciation. And I love it because she's saying, you know, can we please talk about this a little more here? You know, the way she, but the other important part is she's reading. Um, and, and that to me is, uh, is very meaningful. I think it's just a beautiful thing. And, and I actually like the cover. Um, there are study guides uh, for this book. There's a teacher study guide and also a parish study guide available for free on my website. Um, so if you want to have a study group on it, that would be great. But let me talk about how we got to the, uh, <clears throat> to the title and, uh, and I'll go back to the commission. Uh, I was at a commission uh, meeting and what we would do is we, we, would, we would meet in the offices of the Congregation to the Doctrine of the Faith. And the first day we were there, we would have mass and then we'd meet and then we'd have coffee and then we'd go for lunch and then we'd come back. And um, So during one of the lunches, uh, I was seated across from an official of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, who has since left the congregation, but uh, there were maybe 14 of us, a big long table, uh, one across from each other, and of course I was in the middle, 
and I was across from this, this priest and I said, come on now, why can't women be ordained as deacons? And he said, because women can't image Christ. And I said, <laughs> watch me. Uh, so that's where the title came from. And the book itself uh, had its gestation, uh, actually at the American Academy of Religion, I was talking to an editor there um, and began it. But then I had to stop because of the commission work. During the time of the commission, I had a lot of work to do for the commission because I basically volunteered to be everybody's teaching assistant. But I, um, uh, and I was also asked not to speak and not to publish on my topic. Uh, so uh, it, was, it was difficult because I did not want to put into a book anything that really was information or wording. Wording would be more the word that was really only meant for the Holy Father. Um, since I was doing a lot of the writing for the document, I, I didn't want to confuse the issue. Uh, and, and you know yourself how hard it is to keep, uh, uh, keep things separate. <clears throat> anyway, the idea for the book was let's look at the sacraments. And I want to look, I want to look at the sacraments that women uh, participated in, that women received, um, obviously up to ordination, but also the sacraments that women administered. Um, and, and so I, I go through and it's, I, and also the, the ministries of women deacons. So I go through and the different chapters are baptism, catech catechesis and catechisms, altar service, and uh, uh, spiritual direction and confession, and then the anointing of the sick. All right, um, here's the big takeaway. Uh, women did perform altar service, uh, women did baptize, women did participate in chrismation during the baptisms. Uh, women uh, uh, obviously gave spiritual direction, women heard confessions, and women anointed uh, ill people. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they just don't want to believe it. <laughs> People just don't want to believe it. The middle chapter in the book is really what I've been looking at uh, uh, lately. And it's, it's the chapter that you should not read uh, before you go to bed because you will be very upset. It's the, it's the uh, chapter on altar service. And it talks about how women are barred from the sacred. Why are women barred from the sacred? Well, because women are unpure, impure. Women are unclean. Um, women uh, bleed and then don't die, which is another a whole nother psychological discussion that we could have. But the ancient blood taboos that really are existing today in the world, uh, in, in cultures perhaps not so much in our own, um, <clears throat> but in, in developing countries, uh, you'll find women shoved into menstruation huts. You know, you, you'll find uh, in other religions, uh, obviously in the Orthodox Judaism, the 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 uh, the mikvah baths, um, the the whole the whole problem, uh, to my mind, about uh, women approaching the sacred, uh, is this this disgusting, um, almost tribal memory of women women being dirty, uh, and and so. Um, that's why when you think about Spiritus Domino and Domini and you think about Canon 230 paragraph one, it is now absolutely legal for women to be on the other side of the fence, to be inside the altar rail uh, and to be near the sacred. Um, uh, I tell the story in this book about Pope Gelasius. Pope Gelasius lived in the fifth century. He was a, a African, a African Pope. Uh, from Roman Africa, and he really wanted to straighten out the uh, uh, the liturgical problems of uh, of his his church, and he wrote really angrily uh, about what was going on in uh, the southern part of Italy. And he wrote to three specific uh, provinces in in the southern part of Italy uh, because women were doing at the altar, everything the men did. And he was just scandalized. Well, that begs the question in a sense, because what were the women doing? Uh, the, the chances are, and there's only one academic paper I've found that argues that these women were priests. I, I can't say that they weren't doing priestly things. Um, 
but I, have, I really don't have any uh, much or any information about historical ordination of women as priests, but, but women were ordained as deacons. And we know because through the centuries up to the 16th century, deacons were repeatedly or increasingly, shall we say, forbidden from celebrating Eucharist. Um, and finally, when you get to Trent, the, you know, the, 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 the bar comes down. But what else were women doing? You know, Gelasius's problem was that women were at the altar doing what the men did. Well, assuming they were women deacons, uh, or uh, assuming they were deacons, they, they probably were mixing the, the, uh, the water and the wine and handing the chalice to the priest. What's the problem with that? Well, you think there's no problem with it. However, the, the increasing, even to this day, and I was reading some documents today that really curl your hair, um, was women touching the sacred, women touching sacred vessels, women touching um, sacred linens. Uh, I, there, there's one document I read that if, if uh, after the uh, celebration of Eucharist, the linens that were used had to be rinsed by a man before they were handed to a woman outside the uh, sanctuary for laundering uh, because women could not touch uh, the sacred linens elsewise. I, I mean, there's, there's just the most uh, extraordinary uh, information that, that you come across. Uh, the Council of Paris in 1829 uh, makes it quite, quite clear uh, that women are not supposed to be near the altar. Uh, and we have documentation really into the 20th century, that women can't be uh, can't be on the other side of the altar rail. Um, uh, there's one one uh, document I saw just before Vatican II. The question went to the Congregation for the Doctrine of uh, No Congregation for Divine Worship, and uh, the question was: Look, even in in houses of uh, of women, women religious, is it possible for the women to read the scripture? No, came back. Uh, and certainly impossible for a woman to uh, give the responses at the mass, if, and only if, and I did see one document where they said, well, if you're really in trouble because you have to have somebody to give the responses to the mass, a woman uh, could give the responses to the mass, but not from inside the altar rail. So when we think about Canon 230 paragraph uh, one, and we think about the problems uh, that the, the church has had accepting the full humanity uh, of women uh, uh, we find that this is this is rather a big step uh, that the Holy Father has made it legal that women are made in the image and likeness of God. Uh, he hasn't gone so far yet as to say women can image Christ, but I would say if you don't agree with that, uh, then you're a heretic. So um, we we and and I and I have said this to many uh, uh, to many clerics and not not scholars, just just working guys. And they, they say, what, what is the problem? I said, because they tell me women can't image Christ. And, 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 and they, they just look at me dumbfounded uh, because they understand, as you understand, that the Christ is the risen Lord who's beyond gender. The, the people who think that a woman can't image Christ are, are, are stuck in, in, in the idea uh, of the human male Jesus. And, and they, it's almost denying the resurrection, actually. Um, but uh, I get a lot of I get pushback from on that from uh, the far right uh, in the church, but I haven't had any serious pushback on it from serious academics. So, um, so that's that's really where the book came from. That's really what I talk about. Um, the uh, I can quickly tell you because we're almost running out of time. I'm supposed to stop after 25 minutes. The um, the uh, uh, the point of baptism. In baptism, uh, in the early church, um, baptismal fonts weren't neat little things in the back of the church. They, there were these big stone events with um, concentric circles, stairs. I've actually been in one in, uh, in Naples. Um, and you, you would go into the pool down these stairs, no railings, you know, just so you'd need help. And the woman, uh, the woman deacon would be there to help you because chances are you either unclothed or just with a simple slip. Now, where was the bishop? There's one document in one of the books uh, Deb, Deb mentioned, uh, women, women deacons question mark, uh, essays with answers. At least I think she, she mentioned it. And it was an essay I was translating. It was the darndest thing to translate because I couldn't figure out what they were talking about. But now if you have the picture, 
of the woman and the woman deacon going down into the into the pool and she's covered in a veil or you know like a wet t-shirt contest in a way um then you where's the bishop well the bishop can't look at her and the bishop can't can't touch her so what we finally figured out was they had a screen or or a curtain between the bishop and the pool and so the woman deacon would control the action and at the appropriate time the bishop would stick his hand through the, through the veil and do whatever he did but he couldn't touch the woman uh, and then uh, of course there was the chrismation in in the eastern church and most most of this most of this is going on in in the eastern uh tradition you know um really for the longest time there, there were 500 uh, uh eastern monasteries in italy now there are two uh but the the uh, the greek tradition was was very well rooted in italy so you can see where uh the attempt of Gelasius in the fifth century to kind of Latinize things and regularize things uh, um, took took place. Uh, I will I will just read you. So that's baptism, uh, catechism, and, and and catechesis. You know, women teach what the men write, and and that if you look carefully into the history of catechisms, it becomes rather difficult uh, to to to. Uh, to understand uh, spiritual direction and confession quickly. Uh, abbesses, um, particularly territorial abbesses, had a jurisdiction. And, and part of their um, jurisdiction was over sacrament and over the appointment of priests. Um, they, we know they heard confessions. We know they heard confessions because there are lots of laws saying they can't hear confessions. You know, um, whether it was accepted as legal or illegal, uh, I really haven't gone into that depth uh, of the because the point that I make is that confession, uh, also as related to anointing, became a juridical act uh, and not an act of of healing, and, and that and that to me is it's just a crime. Uh, to to move away from the um, the human need uh, to be healed uh, physically and emotionally and spiritually and and then the anointing of the sick and we have a lot of uh, information about uh, women uh, anointing uh, sacramentally uh, abbesses and also others in the in the abbey um, more than one was typically ordained as a deacon. Uh, and uh, Jean Danielou uh, is of the opinion, he takes it from Epiphanius, he's of the opinion that, that these were sacramental anointings. But uh, anyway, that's the book and I go through it. And I'll just leave you with what Math Matthew Blastaris wrote about, um, about women's altar service, uh, because it's, it's, quite, it's really quite telling uh, to me. <clears throat> and it's, it's at the beginning of chapter three, which as I said earlier, don't read uh, before you go to bed because you'll be too annoyed. Um, Blastaris writes, in, this is in the 14th century. Hardly anyone, however, knows what ministerial service women deacons fulfilled in the clerical office at the time. Others say it was permitted for these women to go approach, to approach even the holy altar and go about the tasks of the male deacons much like them. But they've been prevented by later fathers, both from ascending to this and from pursuing the tasks of the ministerial service because of the involuntary flow of their menses. But that the holy altar was accessible long ago also to women is something that has been inferred from many other things. Um, and that's Matthew Blast story. So the fact that the holy altar was accessible, it's now accessible again uh, with canon, the change to Canon 230, uh, paragraph one. Uh, but Deb, Deb said she was going to voice questions or folks are going to ask me questions i'm not sure. sure yes uh so we're going to do the if you've been on these calls before so if you'd like to ask a question you unmute yourself and then you come to the top you could also raise your hand if you know how to do that on your on your um uh screen so um and just and so as we're waiting for people to unmute and come to the top of the list um phyllis the one question i have that I'm not clear on because it sounds so ludicrous to me that women cannot image Christ. When did that actually come 
into the picture. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that I heard the hist you know, a quick history of it, but um, when and when did any cleric make this ludicrous claim? Do you know that, like when it first started? Well, it's, that's the reason women can't be ordained. When it first started, I don't know. I mean, uh, okay. I, 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 in my book, Holy Saturday, there's a whole chapter okay. on the problem of sign and symbol. And I think it's just something that's always been there that, uh, uh, that the confusion is between the uh, celebrant being or the, the person who is ordained being the sign of Christ or the symbol of Christ. And that's the mix up. And okay. so I really, in terms of what, reading the philosophy and the theology of it, have read 20th century uh, commentary, not, not historical commentary. I think it's just like always been there. Hmm. That, that, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, Teresa Birch, you have a question. Go ahead. You can unmute. Can't hear you. Can you unmute yourself, Teresa? Yes, sorry. There you go. Well, thank you, Phyllis, for correcting my bad language on Facebook. <laughs> um, I have a really serious question. I have friends in Germany, and they're uh, pastoral referents, and they can give homilies during Mass, and uh, they participate. I mean, they they can't baptize, and, and you know, they can't participate in other sacraments, but uh, during the Mass on Sundays, they give homilies. Um, I think, I know it's in Germany because uh, they do that and it also in Switzerland, maybe other countries. But I often thought, isn't that like a doorway to consider, like, I think what you said, you know, it's, it's such a significant thing that now everyone all over the world, women can participate in, uh, you know, being either servers or electors, EMs, which I have done already. But the idea that women participate in the Eucharist, process with the priest, and can give the homily, I would think that would be really significant in terms of thinking of next steps or, I mean, what, if they can do that, then why can't they do it all over the world? Women cannot give the homily at a mass. Well, it's not a homily, it's a reflection on the scripture. Exactly. Right. The, the, uh, the individual who is the homilist must be a cleric who participates in the mass. Right. Uh, that's why, uh, and, and it must be a deacon or a priest or a bishop. Right. Uh, seminarians are not permitted to to give homilies, uh, and and the other thing that happens is you'll find the visiting missioner who uh, comes in from the wing to make the request. But, but in fact, it's called something different. But it's it is reflection. The, yeah, but it's, it's the same. Fine, but, but the reflection the, legally, the reflection is supposed to be given after communion, and uh, I. And not at the after the after the gospel. I, I'm just I'm not I'm not arguing one way or the other. I'm simply no, I know I know not what the rule is. So yeah, um, yes, it's important for women's voices. The only the only um, wiggle room is in 1994. There was a um, there was a uh, finding by uh, uh, I think divine worship that for masses for children. Uh, individuals who are more capable of speaking to children may give the homily. Yeah. And that, that's the only thing. And I have a friend who was a college uh, chaplain and she figured, well, you know, they're children. So uh, yeah, yeah right. sure they're homilies. Well, I think, I think what Ruth, my friend said was that it was the practice to give the reflection that I'll call it the homily after the gospel and the German bishops uh, had they had some give they had a vote and they all voted no that they don't want them to present it then so they it's not it's not a votable item it's not it's not something that you can vote on it's it's a law uh, and it's a it's a liturgical law and canon law says that um, uh, that liturgical law is is uh, you know stands. Well, maybe they, maybe they misapplied it because at first they were really giving the reflections um, after the gospel. I mean, it's it's a moot point, but the point is, well, it's not. I don't think so at all. I think it's very yeah. important for the uh, the preacher to come hmm. on after the homily uh, after the gospel. What I because you're you're breaking open the word of God. 
what and and the wonderful efforts of Teacher Church with uh, Catholic Women Preach. Uh, this is these are women who are giving reflections or homilies, whatever you want to call them, and you can switch them on after you do the gospel in your TV mass or your video mass. The um, the uh, the homilist is speaking on behalf of the bishop, and okay. uh, the homilist is. Uh, one one way of doing it, people, uh, the the priest will say, oh, you know, this and that about the gospel, and now we'll hear a, a few words from Sister Jane, but that gets quashed every so often, and uh, you know, I'm just telling you what the law is. You have to Phyllis, make... so so can, let's. Can anyone let's, hear me? Yeah. Uh, well, let me let me just. Uh, I want to move to the next question. So, Margaret Moore, would you go ahead and answer, ask your question? Yeah, Phyllis, knowing the uh, church as it is now, if women were deacons, and they'd have to fit into this pre-existing structure being under the bishop and probably not being much appreciated by the men ordained deacons. How do you see that um, working out? And how many women would want to be with the caliber of some of our bishops want to be ordained a deaconess and have to serve under a bishop that they, uh, just putting it kindly, don't appreciate? Yeah, well, they wouldn't be ordained deaconesses, they'd be ordained as deacons. And a lot of men have problems with bishops and a lot of associates have problems with pastors. Uh, the formation of many of the men, uh, priests and bishops, certainly in the United States and elsewhere is abysmal uh, in yeah. many cases. And, uh, you know, I uh, people ask me this question all the time and I say, well, there's two ways to break a box. And I just think it's easy to break it from the inside. Uh, some people want to break it from the outside. I, I think it depends on the movement of the spirit in the individual and in the church. Um, and I think it could help if, uh, if men, I, I remember years ago, I was speaking in a Jesuit parish, actually Jim Martin, James Martin, Jesuit, and I were having a conversation and uh, I said, uh, you know, why is it that religious priests particularly are able to work, in my experience, work more, more professionally with women ministers? Mm -hmm. And at that, two guys in the back upped and walked out. I, and, and I, I, you know, and after the, uh, after the event, the uh, pastor of the, of the church came and said, you insulted uh, uh, secular clerics. They, work, they walked out. I said, well, they proved my point. Yeah. I said, why didn't they just raise their hands and say, you're full of it, you know? I, you know. So uh, I, I think, uh, you know, there are plenty of well-formed uh, men and there are plenty of ill-formed men. And, uh, uh, you know, you just, I just have to, you know, the, the church is both human and divine and it's, its divinity has really saved its humanity. I, I had a friend of mine from Rome write the other day that he's convinced that the only reason the church is still existing these days is because of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Great. Right? Yeah. Let's thank you. Let's move Phyllis, on to Phyllis. Lucia. I don't know if no. anyone can. Yeah, you, can we can hear, hear me. Yeah, we can hear you, but we we're taking questions in order. So if you could uh, just wait uh, until I call on you, uh, Lucille Elwell, you are the next one in line. Can you ask your question? Uh, you'll need to unmute yourself, Lucille. Yeah, I, I just had to hit the right button. Yeah, yeah. Um, 30, 40 years ago, um, in the uh, Archdiocese of Toronto, um, I served as a woman uh, lector. Uh, read, read, we sat at the altar that, on the side pew, right on the altar, and went up to the lectern and read the readings, but not the, go not the gospel. Um, I also know that um, I read the part of the narrator on uh, Palm Sunday on the Palm Sunday fashion, yeah, Palm Sunday. So um, it, it is rather interesting uh, that when the next cardinal came to pass, um, it was we were extraordinary. We were called extraordinary uh, ministers. Okay, so lector and ministers of communion were considered extraordinary, but they were allowed to be seated up up on the altar. And when the next cardinal came along, he said he didn't want to see any women up in the altar area. They had to come from the congregation and come forward. So there was just sort of like this regression of even whatever status we had at that point. And, and so I think, you know, the person's comment about Germany 
just um, made me think that perhaps there was different direction from different um, pastoral communities. Perhaps bishopry, bishopry or something. There are two points there, if I may. Uh, one, uh, Canon 230, paragraph two, uh, in 1983, said any lay person can, can be deputed temporarily by the bishop to be lector or acolyte. However, there were other findings in canon, in, in liturgical law, that said if a woman was to be the lector, uh, she should not read from inside the altar rail. So uh, if it's the same archbishop who tried to have me stop me from speaking in 2016 in Toronto, um, I could see where he would look up the books and possibly even have a separate lectern. For in, some, in some territories, there were separate, uh, it wasn't even an ambo, there was a separate lectern for a woman to use that was outside, uh, outside the, the altar rail. Um, that that uh, went away in 1990. Uh, uh, it took until 1994 for the uh, for the Vatican to publish. Uh, it was a 1992 uh, determination, but it took until 1994 for them to publish uh, the fact that uh, women and men, uh, women could be altar servers and men could be altar servers temporarily deputed. So uh, okay. there's a big, a big. Uh, I'm writing this now. A big, big resistance to having women near the sacred. Thank you. So I'm going to go to Patrick. I, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Sorry if I butchered it's your okay. name. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Irish Gaelic. It's not even how we ever pronounce it. It's like <laughs> okay. boring. It's like, okay. so. So. Um, Patrick Comfrey, New York City. Uh, I'm assisting my wife, Susan Campichero, on the Women Deacons Film Project with her production company. Thank you. I met Phyllis. Um, I mean, don't read your other book either. I'm up to page 74 and I'm thoroughly ticked off. Uh, but then again, I remember as a teenage boy telling my mother, I am not defending my gender. It's just not happening. I can't. Um, my thing that I'm not working on the film project, I'm trying to get in learning everything. My learning curve is tremendous at this point. It's I've never felt more ignorant about anything in my life. Um, but the thing that I'm trying to understand, knowing the prejudices, gender prejudices, is but so my question, this is a question for me. Um, when they say women can't image Christ, what do they literally mean by that word image? The symbol and sign that I, I don't have a male body. That, that's, okay. Okay. That's the bottom line. Okay, I got that. But then, then I'm left with then. Okay. But a woman could give birth to Jesus, <laughs> and when God was going to make the determination to have His Son come down onto this plane of existence, He didn't go to the Sanhedrin. He went to Mary. He spoke to a girl. So to me, I just can't comprehend the ludicrousness of this argument practically that I, I'm still, I, I, if I, I know that if I can get to the point where I could comprehend what the resistance is, I know there would be the appropriate question that would probably have them get really mad at me, obviously, but it's, I think that's, if there's anything you could help in the sense of, I can't comprehend in this day and age, mind you, this day and age, the the uh, the inability to see the need, the necessity for what women who represent over more than fifty percent of those that are having the church happen today. I I just I don't get it. I guess. Well. Um... I think, you know, <clears throat> it, it redounds to the earlier question uh, about formation in men. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to uh, spend time um, so up close and personal with the Holy Father. Um, he's, he's just like a regular person. <laughs> he's, he's not threatened by men. He's not threatened by women. Uh, but, but too many are. And so when you have the 
almost the entire system creating the rules, you find that you have this ingrained fear of women. And um, wrapping your head around the fact that the argument that women cannot image Christ is a very difficult thing. And as I said earlier, it's heretical. Um, we are made in the image and likeness of God. For further information, please see question 42 in the Baltimore Catechism. That's what I memorized when I was in the first grade. And, and that's what I believe. And Jesus is God. And I can be the sign, uh, uh, maybe even the symbol, but I won't go there because the people who argue on behalf of the symbolism of the ordin or the ordinandi, the people who are getting ordained, um, the, are arguing for the male body, uh, and and it creates, you know, to me some um, uh, to be kind mental problems uh, in some priests who, who think that they are uh, really have have this mantle that they uh, represent Jesus to me in a, in an unhealthy way. I look at you, I see Jesus. We have how many? Three hundred sixty-eight people. Three hundred sixty-eight. Christ on on the show tonight and 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 for people and that's where I, I come back to the Holy Father sees Christ in every person you see him when he is with the disabled um, and that is what that is what uh, we are called to do is to see Christ in every single individual we meet and unless unless and until uh, we can we can bring the church along to that uh, Patrick I I you know, I don't. I don't know if I can. I can help you out. I mean, it's, no, it's, it's you need okay. to do it. Blessed yeah. Sacrament. It's what I need to do at Hofstra University, and it's what we yeah. all need to do, whether we're in New Zealand or in Zimbabwe or you know New Jersey. It's 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 our task uh, to bring right. the gospel to the people of God. Yeah, it uh, just to let you know, it's like in my dismayment of uh, this subject and, and the film has had a profound positive impact on my my marriage with my wife and <laughs> it's it's quite the wrestlement with this conversation it's very engaging to say the least <laughs> so thanks thank so much thanks so much let's move barbara Bourne. you're next up on the list uh hi i just have a question with francis's new decree about uh, giving women more official uh, opportunities to serve uh is there anything we can do with parishes that are basically excluding women totally or even some dioceses like in phoenix or lincoln nebraska where there's really women are pretty much pushed out of any kind of service what can we do to push back against that well the documents from the congregation for divine worship say uh basically that it's up to a bishop to decide this is actually before this this came up to a bishop to decide and bishops conferences to decide whether they want to uh, temporarily or now it would apply permanently um, have women as lectors or acolytes. So that's the first hurdle is whether the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, now the USCCB has said, yes, we can have uh, women lectors and acolytes. Then it redounds to the bishop and the bishop can say, well, yeah, either I want them or I don't want them in my diocese. However, if a bishop says, I do want them in my diocese, no priest is required to have a woman altar server or a woman lector in his parish. Now, if you get back to the two dioceses, you mentioned Lincoln, Nebraska and Phoenix. Phoenix refuses to have uh, women altar servers in its, uh, in its cathedral, uh, as does, I think, San Francisco. And uh, Lincoln, Nebraska doesn't even have, ne have deacons. Lincoln, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska installs men as lectors and acolytes, and therefore uh, will not, doesn't just doesn't have, uh, it, you can only be an installed lector or acolyte, and it doesn't matter whether you're eight or 85, you have to be male uh, to be a lector or acolyte in, in, uh, in Lincoln. They do allow women readers, uh, but I don't know if they're allowed to read from inside the altar rail there. So what can you do? I don't know. I mean, I, I polled bishops uh, in the United States. What do you think about this? And uh, I had basically three responses. One was no comment. Um, another was, we're going to see what the USCCB says. And the other, which is typical probably of the bishops you're thinking of, uh, was to ignore my question. Uh, wow. So, <laughs> Okay, gosh, thanks so much. 
Uh, let's go to Andrea Di Giovanni. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Zagano. Um, I teach biblical studies uh, at a small seminary. And so as you might imagine, some of these questions about women's leadership come up very frequently. And so my question is actually about how um, tradition works. And I'm thinking about your example about um, women, uh, ha like evidence for women have, having done heard confessions or, or done anointings. And so it, what I'm wondering about is that if that had been allowed to continue, or even if nothing had been said at all, it would have been part of tradition. It would have been developed along with the practices and memory of the church. But because it was forbidden, it, it, it kind of put the blocks on it becoming part of tradition. And yet we will rely on those practices uh, as having happened in order to maybe hopefully have them happen again. And so I guess my question is, what are the mechanisms of tradition? How do we, how will that how will that become again part of tradition? Um, is it, will it be like new or is it still true? Do, does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. I, when yes. I was in high school, um, one of my teachers, actually she, she, she she's my math teacher. She left, uh, left class to go march in Selma, Selma by him. But uh, she, um, uh, she used to say when women are ordained, the first sentence will be as the church mm -hmm. has always taught. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that um, uh, we know that women were doing things because women are repeatedly through history forbidden from doing things. Just as I said, deacons themselves are forbidden. Deacons are in the 16th century uh, forbidden from doing sacramental confessions. Well, why would they bother forbidding them if they weren't doing it? Uh, there's a three volume history of auricular confession, uh, which, which describes the whole history. Now, in terms of, of moving into tradition, to me, the tradition is what has been forbidden. And, and, and we, uh, so, so, because we know women uh, up until the 12th century um, were ordained uh, in uh, Lucca uh, in the north of Italy, basically because communication wasn't very good and the bishop didn't get the memo. And if he did, he didn't care. And he, we know he ordained women as, as deacons. Mm -hmm. The problem, of history is that uh, starting with really with the 10th century, but earlier uh, in various times and various places, um, women were, were put into monasteries and the monasteries failed. Uh, monasteries failed widely in the 10th or after the 10th century because uh, stipends were invented. Mm -hmm. And so um, priest prayers uh, were, were better than women's prayers. Um, and uh, <clears throat> And I think a lot of tradition is lost because, uh, because it's destroyed. I, I do think a lot of the documentation is destroyed. So I, I, I don't know how better than to, to, well, look at what the Holy Father just did. Um, oh, in the, in the years since the change in canon law in 1983, and then again in 1994, when it became pretty obvious that women, um, uh, had been serving and therefore legally could serve. Mm -hmm. um, now he's Fuck. up with something that has been requested since 2008 um, mm -hmm. by a synod of bishops. And again, in 2019 by a synod of bishops. You now for Pete's sakes, install these women. Uh, I was in Belgium uh, in, in February of last year and uh, a bit, the Bishop of Liège said, who's gonna train all these women lectors and acolytes? I said, well, the women did well, but he didn't like that answer. Uh, and, and I, but, but the point here to me is women are doing it. And now the Holy Father is saying they should be ceremonially appointed. And it, it runs this whole, this runs through uh, Great Amazonia too, that the ministry of women needs to be professionalized. Um, and we can't go there now, we don't have time. Um, although once, you know, uh, I have two speeds, 45 minutes and an hour and a half. But, but, um, but Canon 517, paragraph two, speaks about parish life coordinators. And the Holy Father is saying in Great Amazonia, you know, women, 60, 60, 67%, some crazy percentage of, of parishes in the Amazon are run by women. Well, let's yeah. professionalize them. Yeah. Let's, 
let's 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 you know understand who they are and have them formally appointed but the actual patients of the diaconate that's another con the discussion but <clears throat> but let's professionalize them here so yeah. um, i think tradition um i think law catches up with tradition and i think once the law is made all of a sudden the, tra the tradition is found um so as my high school teacher said you know as the church has always has always taught um, you know, women were deacons. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so okay. Much. Yeah, we're getting we're getting close to the end here. Rita Houlihan, go ahead. You're next up. Okay, I'll be really quick. Yeah. First, thank you so much, Phyllis. It was great to hear you, and I I love I love the book. Um, I wanted to um, just propose one thing on this uh, difficulty of uh, men accepting that women can image Christ. That you know, as the cult of virginity developed in uh, like the fourth century or so, and Ambrose and Augustine were all discussing like you know what was right and what was wrong about women, um, uh, you know th this evolved this idea of that women were like the repository of sin, you know, and as this cult of you know of like like a denigrating or dissing Eve. And then, and of course, then with uh, Gregory the first in his famous homily in 591, when he basically said Mary Magdalene, you know, was the seat, also was the seat of sin. Um, I, I, somehow I feel that that's connected, that when, the, when you picture that woman, you know, with all of their fluids, and of course, you know, Ambrose was really big on like, no fluid of a woman ever touched the body of Jesus. That's therefore, you get into all that kind of, um, you know, like the ever Virgin Mary uh, teachings. Um, I do think that's connected, uh, you know, that this image, this, this conviction that women carried sin in their bodies um, and that, you know, and Augustine certainly with his, you know, challenges of, you know, and hating, hating his own feelings of lust, et cetera. Um, I think that contributed to it and maybe helped to build up because as you outline the book, you know, these, these councils, like over, it took years. It didn't all happen at once. It was one after another. And they're popping up in different regions. Like, no, you can't touch a chalice in uh, France. Oh no, you can't be at the table in Italy. You know, they're, they're calling out, as you point out, that women were doing these things. So, and then it took the Council of Trent to basically wipe it out, <laughs> you know, like saying, and that's, um, it's also inter interesting that it was at the Council of Trent that, Finally, they made a list of saints, and in that they said Mary Magdalene is only a penitent, and they took all her other titles away, and then they made it real clear women can't do X, Y, and Z forever. So I don't. I, what do you think of that? Do you think that there's a connection between, you know, women as you know their sexuality makes them a you know dangerous and therefore a vessel of sin, and therefore they can't image Christ? Well, uh, gentlemen and. Uh... And Augustine certainly had had problems uh, uh, with women, <clears throat> and certainly had real problems with sex and marital relations uh, until they figured out that if nobody had sex, there wouldn't be any babies, and if there were no babies, there wouldn't be any church. So um, that's the that's the reason they uh, they overcame some of their. Uh, their difficulties. It's a while since I've taught this, but um, uh, you know, when, when um, I think there's no accounting for um, for people's uh, fear of their sexuality, whatever it is, you know, and uh, and their fear of of losing control, and so um, men's fears. Uh, I'm not a psychologist, but men and little boys and big boys grow up with a lot of fears uh, about their um, their relations uh, with other human beings. And so, um, uh, yeah, we see it. Uh, we, we see it. Um, now, it's interesting in the Greek church, there's, there's never any problem about this. And even one Western, um, even one Pope, said, for crying out loud, get over the business about menstruation. It's perfectly normal and it doesn't make people dirty. But, uh, but that kind of went away mm -hmm. and, and it, it keeps coming up. Uh, uh, it, 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 I used to think of it as a treehouse mentality. You know, um, this is my treehouse and the girls aren't allowed. 
and, and yeah, can, oh, great. One more question, then we're gonna then we're gonna uh, end it for the night. Evangeline, uh, welcome. So glad you're here. Go ahead and ask your question. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. I wanted to ask this question. There's so much a similarity between the practice of the church with regard to treatment of women and the pattern of constructing that negative other as far as racism is concerned and casteism and any of those isms. This imagined fear or uh, threat to their own powers demands a construction of that negative other. And I'm wondering whether this imagined fear and threat is actually about losing one's own power and control over one's own body and sexuality. Mm -hmm. And if we can, if we can bring these uh, parallels to the surface and also point out to how this history has been narrated, repeated, and how that continuation of power happens in the church. And then to peel off the layers and lay it bare to see how patriarchy is the foundation of all these isms. I serve as a pastor for, I was ordained in 2006. And now I am a pastor of two congregations. I faced these questions initially, the same questions. But at each time, you know, kind of uh, layer by layer, we can arrive, the possibility of arriving at a new point. So I'm wondering, uh, can, uh, I mean, uh, to divide the time between analysis of systems practice to how can we dislodge those dominant histories? Is that possible? Well, that's my question. I, you know, uh, I'd suggest you read Levinas and the problem of alter, alter, alternity, uh, alterity, the, the, the prob, problem of the other. Um, uh, there's me and the not me, and, and it becomes a philosophical question that gets mixed up with, uh, uh, and I would disagree with Janice Plus, who, who just, just put up, uh, it's Roman paterfamilias. It goes way back uh, beyond that. Uh, and that's in the church. We, we find that uh, the other is, the other is always dangerous, you know, the not me is always dangerous. So um, there's me and not me. And if, if, if the me is, if the not me is different from the me, then immediately I, I find danger. And, and the response to danger is to try to control. But, uh, but that would take about, um, several hours for us to talk through that. I could recommend <laughs> Vishagrad or I could re recommend Emmanuel Levinas, you know, for the, for the problem of alterity. Very good. Thank you all so much. I'm going to turn this over uh, to Russ, who's gonna just uh, wrap things up and we'll do a prayer. But uh, first I just wanna say uh, thanks, Philip. It's just been uh, absolutely terrific. And your questions were absolutely terrific. So thank you all. Thank you, Deb, and thank you, Phyllis, and thank you, everyone, for your questions. Just three announcements that I wanted to uh, put out for you. I'm going to put some links in the chat box. Um, so if no one chats me individually, that'll let me go to the other one. There we go. All right, so uh, a couple things coming up. Uh, first thing is that our next Women Race session is on the women of the Second Vatican Council with uh, Sister Maureen Sullivan, a Dominican uh, sister. And that's on February 16th at 8 p.m. So uh, there's a link there. 
uh, if you want to read more about that, because you've already signed up for the Women Race series, you will get that link in your email. Also, uh, Deb and I and the entire Future Church community are really proud of our uh, Women Witnesses for Racial Justice. Uh, so you can check um, out. We have free downloads there. Uh, if you go to slash WWRJ dash downloads, uh, you can see uh, the, the three that we have ready and all the more that are to come. In addition to that, we do have monthly prayers and presentations. Uh, so right now, uh, if you go to that link, you'll be able to see the videos of all of our uh, past uh, prayers. And we'll soon have some announcements for the, the, for the upcoming schedule. And then finally, for Lent, we are uh, doing Women Discovered. It's sort of the, the inverse of Women Erased. It's Women Discovered, Women Lost or re Rediscovered in the Bible. And if you'll remember, Dr. Uh, Lizzie Byrne DeGeer, who presented on her film, Madam, uh, she'll be leading that Bible study. It's six weeks. So it begins the, uh, the Wednesday after Ash Wednesday. So uh, please join us for that. It is free, um, but... Um, if uh, we are asking for a $25 donation if you're able to do that. And for our closing prayer, we will sing the last two verses of Women of the Church. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight, and especially Dr. Zagano, and uh, all of you who support us who make this, these kinds of presentations possible. Spring.